Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 21 of the Very Not Random podcast. I'm Pat Sherwood. Today's episode, Adrian and I caught up with Michelle Moots, who's a phenomenal trainer with an expertise in special populations. We had so much great content and the discussion went so long that we had to break it up into two parts. So this is part one. Enjoy. And when it ends, even if it seems abrupt, don't worry. Come back next week for episode 22, and you'll be able to hear the conclusion of our interview with Michelle Moots. Michelle Moots, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm <laughs> beyond excited to be here with you both fine gentlemen that I haven't uh, seen in a while. <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a good time. It, we'd like to just dive right into these things. So I'm gonna dive right in. Dive away. I, I no wanted fluff. to no fluff. <laughs> I wanted to have you on the show as soon as possible because you're not only a profoundly, you know, capable trainer in your own right, but you have some experience with a segment of the population that I think personally is extremely rewarding to work with, but potentially really intimidating. And mm -hmm. there's not a good amount of information out there. And, and I would categorize those folks as we're talking about obese people, uh, elderly people, people that have interesting, um, uh, circumstances such as the chronically ill, profoundly frail, uh, neglected by a lot of fitness communities, if you will. And when I was dabbling in that arena, that the term that we decided to use was underserved. And, but then I, I heard that that maybe wasn't what we wanted to say anymore. So how, if a, a gym or, you know, if we we're trying to come up with a title for this podcast, how do you encapsulate this segment of the earth that we're trying to help out here? The earth. Um, underserved did not go over well. You are correct in that. So uh, that was more them that gave me that guidance that they didn't okay. love that. But, All right. Um, we kind of went more into special populations that okay. just encompassed kind of the whole uh, arena of populations that you just mentioned. So it, did that's, I leave any that's really out? how I reference it. I don't think so. I think. Um, that's a, that's a pretty big list that you just went yeah. through, and I think it well, encompasses a huge majority of people. Well, I was just going to point that out, that I think that's the interesting part about discussing populations like this, is that you think about the average gym owner or trainer, and I think in their mind, the person that they're catering towards, they don't understand sometimes that that is actually the minority. It's the minority of people oh, yeah. within our society that actually care about their health and have yeah. cared about their health for a long time mm -hmm. and get on it when they're young and stay on it. I mean, that's the person that's, that's unfortunately in the minority. And so I think if you look at the totality of a, any society on earth, the, the vast majority are people that aren't as interested. And then that comes around later in life to have this compounding effect that's problematic. So a hundred percent agree with that. I, I would tell you having, obviously coached on both sides of that, the people that would walk into a CrossFit gym are, are not the people that you just listed are not the people right. that we were really <laughs> right. focused on. Right. And it was, um, an eye opening experience for me to realize, Oh, wait, <laughs> you wouldn't just walk, walk in here and right. for multiple reasons, whether that was, they had underlying things that they were working through and were too sick, frankly, to get there or had had such negative experiences in their previous mm. attempts to ever do anything like that, that they had kind of written it off. You're, so we had both. You're going exactly someplace that I want to go, which is fantastic. But before we even get there, yeah, act for one second, Michelle, that you're not a humble person, that you love to talk about yourself and you <laughs> love to brag. Boz and I could chat about this topic, but we couldn't chat about it with anywhere near the depth of knowledge that you have that's why we brought you on. So for people who aren't familiar with you, give a bit of your background, your credentials, and your experience with this population of people. Ooh, uh, okay. Background, um, physical therapist by trade. And I did that for about 13 years prior to starting CrossFit. Um, started CrossFit in 2004 with Greg at the original gym and that was it. I just was hooked from the minute I started. And literally three months after that came home and told my husband, I was going to quit my job and become a full-time coach. <laughs> awesome. That awesome. conversation was really fun. <laughs> um, but it all seemed to work out. So, um, yeah, so I coached for quite a few years and then, um, started on seminar staff and 
the rest is kind of history with that. Well, so, and hold on. I, I don't want to toot your horn for you a little bit, but I mean, let's just not gloss over that almost, you know, 18 year period. You remember the original gym. That's yep. no small thing. I mean, that's a very small yep. group of people now when you look at the global cross community. Um, yeah. So obviously that, that was a big... That just means you know, I'm old, but yes. Well, so, sure. Yes. But, <laughs> uh, and then you <laughs> um, helped to kind of carry the torch of that forward, right, for some time as well, uh, coaching and, and being a part of kind of the, the Santa Cruz, um, mm -hmm. I don't know what you call it, the explosion there where, where you know, you kind of had the original gym shut down and then a few gyms grew out of that. Uh, and so you were in that scene for quite a long time. Um, you know, so tons of coaching with the regular CrossFit Kind of population and then growing into this uh, population of people that uh, were less likely to step into the gym. And I do think that it's, it's really important when we're talking about coaching in general, but, but this, this group, um, for people to just have the sense of gravity of how long you've been in the mix. I do think that's really, really important. You know, this, is a, this is a craft that you've been developing for decades now, if you include your um, physical therapy training and all that. So this is you know, no small amount of pragmatic mm -hmm. lessons learned in the trenches type of information. And uh, I, I think that sometimes, you know, Pat and I talk about it in the Instagram world and social media landscape of today, these big flashy uh, things tend to grab people's attention. But the real world experience of doing this stuff day in and day out for decades seems to carry less weight. And I'm not going to let that one fly by. So <laughs> just want to highlight Appreciate how that. much the world Appreciate of experience that. that you've got. Yeah. And, yeah. And I also, think in our community on seminar stuff, that's so prevalent that I, I, yeah. we just sometimes, you're right, probably left that go a little bit unnoticed, but. But also sure. the, the amount of experience with this special population. So for example, yep. maybe somebody running a I'm gonna, you always run the risk of offending somebody with a term that you use at a normal affiliate, right? Maybe they have somebody who's, you know, in their 70s or obese or whatnot, uh, a couple clients out of their yeah. entire community. So it's, yeah. it's a smaller number. So for everybody at home, give them a sense of this program that you helped <laughs> grow at CrossFit that, that was Everyone in there was a member of the special population. Every single solitary athlete. How many started and how big was that number at the end? So, um, and I'll get back to kind of what you said earlier, because I think there's some important points there. But when I first started with this, um, I honestly think Greg reached out to me just because of my comfort level with dealing with those people. And that drew directly from my past. I was not intimidated by working with sick people or old people or the people mm -hmm. I think he was trying to target. And that was huge because it is a hurdle towards getting um, coaches to, to be willing to do that. When I started the program in February, started, came into the program in February of 2018, there was about 15 members at that point that were showing up on a consistent basis. Okay. Those were divided into two groups. They had a group of um, those at the time were called underserved. So it was um, chronic disease, gastric bypass patients, a couple cardiac patients, stroke patients, you named it. They put it in that category. And then we had a seniors class, which was way smaller. And the focus of that group was teaching people how to get up and off the ground. So there was a lot more. When I first entered into it, it was the majority of the time was spent on a dolomer mat teaching kind of basic, hey, if you fall at home, here's how you deal with that. Now, what's so interesting to me about this is you mentioned earlier that these are the people that are, you know, they've either had a bad experience at a gym in the past, maybe not necessarily a CrossFit gym, but just, you know, going to the gym as an institution is kind of intimidating as it can be for anybody. Uh, and, and so it's hard to kind of get this group of people in the door. Yeah. What was the method that you guys used to to get people there, how did you attract these people that, you know, let's face it, they're probably not going to be the first candidates right. to sign up for something like this. So how, how did that come to be? So the original group that started there, um, I was not involved with the, the start of that, but that was basically an email campaign put out through um, next door neighbor in the area of Scotts Valley to try to get some 
information about what the program was and who we were looking for or who they were looking for at the time. And then there was also a social media blast, Facebook, other things that they kind of put out there and said, hey, if you're the least likely person to go to a CrossFit gym, this is a free program. No risk to you. Just show up and we'll take care of the rest. And they got a few bites off that. I got to be honest with you. I think the initial thing was we're going to limit the the number here. So first come, first serve, make it enticing to those people to to come in the door. And um, I think originally there was six people that showed up. By the time I got there, again, there was probably closer to 12 to 15. Uh, I honestly took the approach of what I think has always been the methodology of CrossFit. And that is if you do a really good job, every one of those people knows 10 people. And Mm -hmm. it was word of mouth. And we didn't do anything outside of that other than change these people's lives and realize that they all had friends. And it, uh, in all honesty, blew my mind how fast it grew. I think initially those first maybe six or so people were also, uh, you know, regular, you know, CrossFitters in their thirties or forties saw that social media blast and they're like, mom and dad, I just Mm -hmm. found where you're going to go. Get get your butt in there. Some of it was, some of it was, um, some of it was people who I think were at such a, low point in their life Mm. that they had nothing to lose at that point, honestly. And that was just, well, why not? I'm there. I'm not putting out any money, which could have backfired, I think in, in retrospect, but it didn't. And I think I'm not sure you would have ever gotten them in the door if this was a program that they didn't understand the value of. Um, but it went from that initial group, very small group, by the time the program ended, we had 298 members. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, I didn't realize it was that. Yeah. yeah. I That's thought, incredible. I mean, I knew you guys had uh, yeah. some big yeah. numbers in those classes. I remember coming into the office and I would see, you know, the regulars yeah. and say hi to people and stuff like that. But I, I had no idea you guys had almost yeah. 300. I mean, that's almost that's awesome. 300 members. Think about that, wow. right? For, from running a, a traditional uh, gym where yeah. if you have 15 people yeah. in the class, Maybe you've got three newbies, you've got a handful of intermediates, a handful of advanced athletes, and you know you can turn your back maybe for a while on the intermediate or the advanced where you give the the new people a bit of attention and they're still going to be deadlift how they should. This is 300 people you cannot take your eyes off of. Yes, yes, and that it's hurting cats, it really was. So it was um, not a project that by any means I did by myself, so I do not want that to be misunderstood this was um a group effort and thank goodness that uh you know called in a few you owe me ones and and come on down and join this and um these were all seminar staff coaches which was amazing but i think we wanted to ensure at least in the beginning that these were coaches that had a lot of experience and this was not going to be an intimidating uh, uh effort for them and wanted wanted to kind of advance their own coaching skills, which was amazing. So we never ran a class with more with less than two coaches, sometimes three as they got bigger because of that. And it was, <laughs> there's still days. It was just like, Oh God, okay. Charlie's on the GHD again. Charlie, you know, it was just nuts. Some of the <laughs> stuff that happened. So, um, to have I can 23 and that was our average. Our seniors class was averaging 23, 23. people per class. Wow. I, I would say wow. before we even get to the classes running, let's let's take a couple more intermediary steps between interest was put out into the community people are starting to walk in we're eventually going to run classes you touched on very briefly um you know if if coaches from running traditional gyms that aren't dealing with this special population now they're used to maybe some of the hurdles that they have to deal with or encounter of oh i heard that crossfit was dangerous or i am i going to get fill in the blank. Am I Mm -hmm. going to look how I want to look like the traditional things that they hear on a regular basis? You're not hearing those things. You know, what, what are the, the fears uh, or the emotional um, challenges, you know, what what are those conversations like that you had with these special populations to put them at ease to go into this potentially very intimidating environment and do a bunch of stuff that they either have never done in their lives or haven't done in decades? The conversation changed, to be totally honest with you, from when I first walked in the door and they had no idea who I was. And 
I don't think that it's much different than in a traditional gym where you got to earn people's trust, right? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, you can say all you want, but until you can show them, and it was a steep learning curve for me as well. So don't, don't hear me wrong, but um, the class focus was a little bit different with the earlier classes, more special populations classes. It was making sure that we were monitoring those people on a pretty consistent basis. When I first started, it was um, implementing, getting more information in regards to what medications they were on, what what I was dealing with, with each person, and really tailoring that towards their individual needs. And that was a very wide sure. spectrum. We had, again, cardiac patients, we had type, type 2 diabetics, all the way to gastric bypass, and we had a handful of people that were over 500 pounds. So to try to take all that into account in one class, um, the conversation was, we'll take care of you. <laughs> and and not just saying that, but then enabling them to see and prove to themselves like, oh, okay, I can do this because that's scary for a 500 pound gastric bypass patient mm-hmm. to say, well, if I am on the ground, I can't get back up on my own. Mm -hmm. And it's just a whole different element of trust that I think has to happen. How did you get forward? You mentioned earlier something that it was not only a hurdle for the athletes to walk through the door, but a hurdle for coaches, right? Because some coaches might be intimidated. That statement right there. There might be some trainers who are hearing like, oh, yeah, oh that'd, be so, that'd be so cool. I'm going to help some older <laughs> folks and heavy folks. And then yeah. somebody walks in, they go, just, you know, here's my list of surgeries. I've had cardiac yeah. arrest. I'm on these medications. Yeah. They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't yeah. even know where yeah. to start. So how did you or your training staff get comfortable and familiar um, you know, or confident enough, I should say, to handle those things and not be like, uh, I have no clue where to even start with you or, or what I can do that's appropriate? Well, admitting that was probably step one. Like there were people that I'm like, duh, I don't know if this is going to work. And I think, hey, that's just coaching. I got to be honest with you. But I also think um, that was part of the reason we brought in some of our staff coaches because they had such a high level of confidence in the foundations of coaching. And so then it was, okay, this isn't scaling. <laughs> this is scaling times a thousand where... Mm to say today has a pull-up workout and okay, we're going to go to ring rows. For me, it was the eye opener of, well, I can't support my weight on a ring because I'm too heavy or I can't do this. So when I say it was a steep learning curve, it's like, well, okay, then let's try this. And so we got really good at getting very creative with Going back to the basics, which is what's the function of a movement and how do I make this work? Not just for uh, a traditional scaling, but someone who cannot support their own body weight is too heavy to support their own body weight or is too frail to support that. So we got really proficient at kind of focusing more function and less the actual movement pattern that we were going through. And it, it was pretty awesome. Uh, again, not a solo endeavor. The coaches that were in there <laughs> blew my mind. Sometimes Ex- with some explain of the, the that, please. Them. More function, less. Well, so I'll give you an example. Uh, rope climb, <laughs> right? Uh, Usually done like a, a, a legless yeah. L-sit kind of rope climb. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or, Hey, walk yourself down a rope and pull yourself back up. That was not going to happen for a lot of these, these folks. So, um, you know, walking themselves down to a box and pulling themselves back up was okay for some, but we would come up with things like hanging one single ring off of the pull-up rig and having them just pull so they could dictate how much body weight was, was on their hands and on their shoulders and just starting to get the pulling function of a rope climb rather than worrying about them getting their body weight up off the rope. So, Mm -hmm. um, or pull-ups, there's no way I'm putting a 90 year old in a green band hanging off a pull-up bar. It just was bad, bad things in my mind that were going to happen there. So we got really good at, you know, PVC pull downs. Well, the pull is still there. We're still getting all the function of that. And they're in a much safer environment to do that and still gaining all the function and strength of that. So it really was kind of stripping it way, way, way back. And I want to, I want to, 
just pause for a second there and go back to something that Pat brought up about, you know, you have a group of people that may have a medical history that's pretty robust and that can seem pretty intimidating. But um, is, is it a correct kind of assumption on my part to say that it's a mistake to get too fixated on that? And, and what I mean by that is that I think it's easy for somebody who is, you know, admittedly, you're a trainer, you're not a medical professional in that sense. You know, you don't necessarily have a, a full understanding of medications and their contraindications or, you know, the specifics about uh, every, every um, syndrome under the sun, and nor can you. So it's not to say that you should be cavalier about that, but, but does it fundamentally change the approach, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Because it sounds like the answer is no. You just have to be aware of how much further you have to take a step back uh, and, and kind of recenter your own expectations. But fundamentally, it doesn't need to rattle a trainer because you're doing the same thing that you would anyway with a new client. It's just done at a much more, um, maybe extreme is not the right word, but which is a much more granular level, right? So I guess what I'm trying to get at is, does somebody have to get too freaked out about that list of, of things that they may not be familiar with if they are comfortable taking baby steps and really putting that beginning emphasis where it should be? No, and I think that was one of the things that I learned is, um, I would say your best coaches are doing that anyway. And, and to me, this was really just pay attention, just pay attention to what's going on and don't overscale because just like anyone else, right? If we're, if we're limiting their ability to try things and do things, then you're also limiting the results that they're going to get from the program. And so it became kind of this, I don't know if I can do that. I don't either. Let's try. Mm. And, and, um, that's where the trust piece came in, where they probably would not have been as willing to work with us in the beginning, but as their successes grew and we were exposing them to more things and not babying them too much. Oh my gosh, it was amazing. I, I just, and amazing in regards to, you know, take the successes you see in a traditional gym where someone gets their first rope climber, their first pull up, and it's cool to watch that. This was like, basic things that I think most people take for granted. Hey, you know, to, to be able to jump on a plate. And I vividly remember one of the women there crying and saying, it's the first time both my feet have been off the ground in 10 years. And I thought, <sighs> I mean, you right. just, that's the stuff. I think it, it just gets kind of brushed under the rug or forgotten that, that like you said, Boz, it, a lot of people walk in the gym that are so far past where these people might ever get that let's just go back to those small wins that are hugely profound within their life and, and not overshadow that stuff. But if I never asked them to do that, if I, if I said, Oh my God, the risk was too high and I'm never going to go there. Those successes would never happen. And that was, um, scary at times. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. There's points when you're like, Oh boy. Okay. All hands on deck. I don't know how this is going to go down, but it was awesome. Life changing for me, I will say that it was, um, yeah. it gave me a true sense of what it meant to say, I think we kind of throw that term, like we're changing people's lives and, and we are, but within a traditional gym setting, I think you're improving the quality of someone's life, right? Within this setting, I truly think we were actually saving their lives. Mm -hmm. Like there was people wow. that it was, it was just amazing to watch that, that progress happen. So I don't know, gave me a much different perspective yeah. on that. So from the from the trainer's perspective, what what I hear in that statement that you made a little earlier on, and I think this is really important for people that want to reach out to these groups of people and bring them into their gym and that sort of thing, is, is that you don't have to know it all. And if you come into it thinking that you know it all and that you're just gonna like execute this program and you've already got it figured out, that's the mistake. Oh God, There's yeah. no mistake in coming in and saying, I'm not quite sure, but I have a, an idea of where I want to start, but I'm just going to play that one out. We're going to be really, really attentive and see how it actually comes to pass. And mm -hmm. if it's a little bit too much, then we're going to take it down. And if it's not, we're going to take it forward a little bit. But it's not having this set expectation that you already know the outcome. That seems to be the most important thing that I took Absolutely. away from your statement. Yeah. And, and, 
you know, paralysis by analysis is, is very real within that vein because it was too many coaches overthinking that they had to have some expertise within this. And, and it really isn't, you're exactly right. I think it's, you have to be willing and you have to be present within that, but that's it. And, um, uh, the amount of learning that I think happens on both sides, even from the most experienced level of coaching was great. It was awesome. And that's where that community, I think, got incredibly strong was that we were learning alongside of them. And it was, hey, here you go. We're going to just experiment with this and try it. And if it works, great. Then we have this really cool new scale that we can share with people. And if yeah. not, well, nothing ventured, right? So it was always, um, we were always very open about that. And I think it built, it humanized us for sure that we don't have all the answers. We don't know all of this. Who knows? And the bond that I think grew through that was mm. pretty spectacular. So it's like an so. ethos of exploration, uh, absolutely. Which I love that, and I think that's so cool. And, yeah. and what a I mean, treat it, for. Yeah. Well, I, just, I was just going to say, what a treat for trainers like yourself with so much experience. And I know a lot of the people that you brought into that program were also. I mean, they were super coaches. You know, they've been around for yeah. a long time, coaching yeah. in a lot of different realms. And and how cool to be able to immerse yourself into a new challenge and continue to learn from that. I mean, that's, that's rare. So that's very oh. cool on both, both ends. You know, yeah. I'm getting ahead Amazing of myself here. Uh, so I want, I want to circle back to a question I have, but, but you guys just led me somewhere I want to talk about for a sec, which is we say that one of the big important parts of the magic behind CrossFit is the community, right? That you, you build this bond with people through, shared suffering and laughter and challenges and exploration and it's humbling and you have to let your guard down all that stuff is it safe to say or or am i being stereotypical that i'm thinking that maybe somebody who's 500 pounds might not be a social butterfly might not have a big Mm -hmm. social circle you know they're kind of on the fringe of society quite frankly or Mm -hmm. somebody who is 75 or 85 years old might spend more time in their home than out interacting with other human beings. So now you get them into this place that they're not only improving their quality of life and their physical capability, but there's that, and you can't quantify it, right? But there's that social, emotional, communal aspect that improves things. Anyone who's done CrossFit knows it improves things in ways that it's tough to articulate for traditional society. Now we're talking elderly folks, morbidly obese, I have to assume that that they were not only missing what CrossFit could give them from a physical uh, you know, adaptation, but there was that other communal adaptation that maybe they didn't even know that they were missing. And, and what was your experience in that realm? So two, two part in regards to that. Um, I think one of the things that I came into this program thinking and was that Within the traditional gym setting, and you kind of touched on this earlier, you might have one or two seniors in a class, maybe someone who's overweight in a class, but it's not your predominant population. Mm -hmm. And the assumption was always that, hey, let's fold them in. We're one big community. All all, everyone together, right? Mm -hmm. Not that that's wrong. I just don't know that it's appropriate in every situation. And so one of the initial feedback points that I kept hearing from these groups was thank you. Thank you for just making this a class that is just my peers, my peers, whether that was seniors that wanted to work out with other seniors who were at the same, in the same place in life and had more in common, um, or someone who could understand the struggles that they were going through in a more special populations class. So while I don't think it's necessarily a mistake within a traditional gym setting to fold those people in, I just don't think everyone's going to embrace that. And I never asked. I never walked up to Charlie, who's 90, and said, do you mind being in the class with the 30-year-olds? Mm-hmm. I think if I would have just asked them, I might have gotten an answer that I wasn't expecting versus this group that was very adamant that that was part of the reason they came back. Was if they could look around the room and go, these are my people. <laughs> this is awesome. And it did create their own community. Now, where that became incredibly evident as far as the social piece was when we had to shut down for COVID. Oh, Right backslide that happened with uh, particularly the seniors was um incredibly significant they took some major major steps back and they didn't have that 
schedule and they were going to class four days a week and they weren't doing them. They weren't seeing all of their friends. So we made every attempt to try to keep them coming through, you know, zoom or other things, which was interesting in and of itself, but, um, (laughs) but it wasn't, it wasn't the same. It wasn't the same. And I think it was hard to watch all of the progress that they built up and all of the connections that they made be honestly stripped away from them. Hmm. Some of them came back post COVID and some of them didn't. Interesting. So, I mean, you can do air squats on your own, but doing them with a buddy, there's just something there. Totally different. Yep. It's not the same. And it just it was glaring to me like, oh, my gosh, <laughs> the timing of that. Right. It just yeah. uh, it was hard to watch that. Just, oh, my gosh. Some of these that went back into the hospital, we had to go back on medications, had to go. And it was all um, there's a high prevalence of depression within the senior community and the people who were sliding back into that. So just um, I think I, I cannot oversell how important that piece was that was keeping the quality of their life so much better and so much higher. And to watch that dissipate was very hard on all of us. So. Yeah, I bet. Well, so, you know, you mentioned that you had a lot of people say they were so grateful to have this group of people they could work out with that they could kind of relate to. Um, if you had to generalize in the same vein, how many people, once they got their feet under them, so to speak, you know, they've been in the program six months, seven months, whatever, how many of them um, wanted to get into more of like a general population mm. type environment? And how many of them would rather stay? And, and again, I know that's different for everybody. You're going to have people that love it either way um, and have their preferences. But was it kind of a 50-50 split? Was it more one way or the other? Like, what did you observe within that group? probably 90, 10, 90 would have wanted to stay wow. with their own populations and 10% okay. would have been willing. And those were our very high functioning 10% that, that would Got have it. made that transition. Now we were forced to do that, obviously. So within the Santa Cruz County, within that area, we found homes for all of these people, some of which did go into general CrossFit classes, very small percentage, some of which we reached out, um, through the coaches that we had through the program or local gyms that were willing to start these programs and said, are you willing to give up an hour out of your gym and start this class for, for these people? And the two programs that were willing to give them special times that were dedicated to them are flourishing. Hmm. The ones where the people went into the more traditional settings, not so much. The success rate wasn't nearly as high. So it's, to me, it's just all data that, is so useful for any affiliate that is looking towards doing this. I think um, it, it, it was just a, a pretty clear divide there. Oh, incredible. Sure. No, yeah, crucial knowledge for affiliate owners. So yeah. in your traditional CrossFit gym, you know, we kind of touched on a lot of the folks walking through the door, maybe we're in their late 20s, 30s, 40s, but but you can generally put them into a similar bucket. Maybe so-and-so blew their knee out skiing. You know, you Mm -hmm. you have your whatever. But since you can generally put them in the same bucket, you can put almost anybody that walks through the door through the same on-ramp program, and they're good to go. And then six weeks later, they're in class. What (laughs) what, I'm going to assume every person that walked through your door was wildly different. So I'm going to assume you didn't have a a standard on-ramp, so to speak. So what was your process of meeting a new client and actually getting them to begin working out with the group? So I would, um, I filtered everybody who wanted to join the program just mainly because it was a, a free program. So we had to make sure that the people that were in this program were appropriate to be in this program. Um, I would spend usually a, like a 30 minute phone call conversation with them. And I did phone calls because very easy to tell me what, you know, miss all this stuff on an email. So it was much more effective for me to actually pick up the phone and call these people. And, and during a conversation, you would stuff would slip out that Mm -hmm. they may not have told me if, if we weren't having a, a conversation. So, um, that was always step one of like, Hey, why are you interested in this? Who do you know in the program? What's tell me a little bit about yourself. What's your background? What's your history? And you can learn a lot about people just given that their first and it, and it was a lot of uh, you're going to be okay conversations where they were they're scared they're petrified so um 
making their initial experiences really positive was huge. And that was um, ensuring them that they were going to have one person that was looking out for them. So we would Mm. have one coach that was assigned to any new person in a class and they were there by their side through that whole thing. So rather than doing a formal on-ramp, because of the level of the class and kind of the focus of that class, everyone was scaled. I, I honestly cannot think of one workout that anyone did RX. Didn't which is awesome, that we did by it, the way. Which is great. It was amazing. It was incredible. And we never used the word scaled. It was always options. I know you guys saw our whiteboard a lot, but it was, mm-hmm. hey, option one, this is how the workout's written. I don't expect one of you to do that. So let's talk about option <laughs> two, which is a little bit more of the traditional scaling. And option three might be, hey, we're taking it down 10 notches. And then if we need option four, great. We'll do it as we, as we go through it. And, and it was, they knew that going in. So any new person walking in was, had someone standing right next to him, like, okay, this is what we mean by a thruster. This is what we mean by blah, blah, blah. And I had always briefed the coaches, like, here's what's going on with this person. So look for A, B, and C. Here's the meds yeah. they're on. Look for this, this, and this. Here's their underlying conditions, whatever was happening. And it became, they kind of got the sense of, oh, this is different. This is different than what I've heard about this. So it was kind of a win-win for, for everybody. Uh, you, you mentioned the new person comes in, you've got one person just giving them their full attention. So let's talk about that for a mm-hmm. sec of traditional trainer to class size might be one trainer running a class of 15 people. And of course, it varies depending on <laughs> the, the level of proficiency of the trainers, how many folks they're competent with. Now we're not in your traditional, we're dealing with special populations. What was, what did you start at and what did you maybe you shake out? And I realized you had amazing trainers, but what was the ratio of how many people could be in a class and how many trainers you would like to have there? Um, I kind of approached it with like a one to seven and, okay. and it worked out pretty well with some of the people that had been there a little bit longer. Um, you could take your eyes off them for, for a, a little bit longer duration, <laughs> but, but, uh, don't get fooled into that for too, too long. So it was a little bit more challenging. Um, I think of some of the days that we did heavy lifting days with our seniors and wow, then it probably would have been like one to three. <laughs> it would have been a great ratio, although it wasn't feasible, but, um, that was always kind of in the back of my mind. Like that was a good, with our experience group, like five to seven people that you could keep your eyes on. Now, if we knew we had more than one new person um, coming into a class to start, then I would always pull in an extra coach for those days. So maybe they were yeah. focused on those two new people, but it wasn't like, Hey, we're going to throw you in with the general population quite yet. So um, yeah, it, it definitely. You... You might have just said something that could potentially Uh-oh. terrify or scare the uninitiated, well, right? Pat, before oh, you ahead, get to that, because I because I do think we should talk about that, and uh, I, I I think you're absolutely right. Let's give that the, the time and attention it's okay. due. But but as a follow up to this idea of like trainer ratios and stuff like this, I've got, I've got a question, and I'm I'm going to try not to lead the witness too much with this <laughs> because I know how I feel about it, Michelle. But so I'm going to be blunt. Are younger trainers ill suited for this work? um gosh that's a that's a no i think that's a generalization i would say i would say anybody because we actually pulled in some younger trainers some local trainers and had them working alongside us to try to give them some exposure to this um i think anybody who's willing to learn can learn this I, i i wouldn't put an age demographic on it i wouldn't put any any kind of boundaries on that other than you better be humble you better be really really patient Mm -hmm. (laughs) really really patient and you cannot walk into this the biggest mistake i see with some of the younger trainers is thinking that intensity is the end-all be-all and that is not the end-all be-all with this group when it was oh my god just keep them safe and get them to understand get them to show up that mm-hmm. was that was the goal. The rest of it will just kind of take care of itself. Get them to walk in the door. There took a little bit of, for lack of better words, deprogramming of some of the younger trainers that were like, but they have to do that. No, 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 they don't. They don't. So, right. but I don't think I would say they're not suited for it. I think that's a, that's a strong statement that I, I think there's some young trainers that could be amazing in this 
this group. Just got to select the, the right trainers. Okay, yeah, that's good to hear. Under, <laughs> under, yeah, with the understanding that it isn't the, hey, they need to be thrown up in the corner. That, that just, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's not going to work. That's not going to fly. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, awesome. But I don't want to make them feel like they can't participate in this because that's by no means. Fair the enough. Case. I think uh, that's a great answer. I'm, I'm yeah. really glad I asked that question. And Pat, I'm sorry I cut no, you off. No, you're good. So. You, yeah, I think you're right. You probably just have to want to work yeah. with right. this population. Because for example, some yeah. people may love training. They don't want to train kids. It's sure. just not their thing. They still love training. They may not yeah. want to train older people. They may you like yeah. fill in the Amen. blank. You put the right trainer with the right people and you know, you're probably yes. going to have a much better experience. 